The Mujahideen of the Soviet-Afghan War are often mythologized as a scrappy, ragtag band of Muslim warriors who, against all odds, defeated a superpower. And while there is some truth to this narrative, it ignores their humble origins and the significant international support behind the Afghan Jihad. The men who ultimately became known as the Mujahideen were simple villagers who initially only wanted to remove the un-Islamic communist government that had taken over their country. Yet, somehow, they became pawns in a global game for dominance between the United States and the Soviet Union. But this leads us to wonder, what were the origins of the Afghan Mujahideen? In this episode, we will explore the cultural, historical, and geographic factors that led to the Mujahideen. Nineteen seventy nine was a crazy year for the Muslim world. In February 1979, a popular uprising in Iran led to the toppling of Shah Riza Pahlavi and the establishment of a Shiite Islamic government. The very next month, Egypt and Israel concluded a peace treaty marking the end of nearly 30 years of hostility. And then, the month after that, in April 1979, Pakistan's former Prime Minister, Zofika Ali Bhutto, was executed by the military government that had overthrown him. Finally, in December 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, assassinated the communist president of Afghanistan, and replaced him with another communist president? Wait, let's back up a little. Our story really begins in 1964. That year, King Zahir Shah of Afghanistan introduced a new constitution that established an Afghan parliament. This new parliamentary system allowed for the creation of new political parties, including the PDPA or the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan. This was Afghanistan's Communist Party. In 1973, King Zahir Shah was overthrown by his cousin, Dawood Khan. And in 1978, Dawood Khan was overthrown in a Soviet-backed coup led by the PDPA. Norda Mohammed Taraki, leader of the PDPA and a dedicated communist, became the new president and prime minister of Afghanistan. Later that year, the Soviet Union began sending military advisors and equipment to strengthen his government. Nutaraki tried to enforce a land redistribution program and other communist policies that angered rural Afghans. He proceeded to imprison and execute thousands of people who resisted his reforms. Not surprisingly, Nutaraki and the PDPA were very unpopular. An uprising in the city of Herat in the spring of 1979 weakened Taraki's hold on the government. This led to a power struggle between Nur Taraki and his deputy prime minister, Hafizullah Amin. In 1979, Hafizullah Amin overthrew Nur Taraki's government. The unrest in Afghanistan intensified, and Hafizullah Amin turned out to be even more brutal than Nur Taraki had been. And the harsher he became, the stronger the rebellion grew. With things spiraling out of control in Afghanistan, the Soviet Union decided to get rid of Hafizullah Amin. Not only were they upset with him for deposing and killing their guy, Nur Taraki, he was obviously incapable of dealing with the rebellion. On December 27th, 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Kabul, killed Hafizullah Amin, and installed another member of the PDPA, Babra Karmal, as the new president of Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a landlocked country bordered by Pakistan to the east and south, Iran to the west, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan to the north, and China to the northeast. Afghanistan's mountains are the most famous, or infamous, part of its geography. These mountains are part of the Hindu Kush mountain range, which itself is part of the greater Himalaya mountain system. The Hindu Kush mountains, which include some of the highest mountains in the world, run straight through the heart of Afghanistan. 
The high peaks of these mountains block moisture from the Indian Ocean, resulting in a lush, wet environment on one side and a harsh, dry climate on the other. Northern India and western Pakistan got the lush side, while Afghanistan got the dry side. This gives Afghanistan long, severe winters in some areas and hot, dry summers in others. These mountains have also impacted human settlement in Afghanistan. The rough terrain and isolated valleys have allowed many parts of Afghanistan to exist without any interference from the outside world. The people living in these isolated areas have managed to hold on to their cultural traditions and practices even till today. In fact, there are some languages that are only spoken in certain parts of Afghanistan and nowhere else in the world. There are five major ethnic groups in Afghanistan. The Pashtuns are the largest group, making up about 42% of the population. Pashtuns are predominantly Sunni Muslim and are generally found in the southern and eastern parts of the country. Tajiks are the second largest group and comprise about 27% of the population. Tajiks are also predominantly Muslim and are found in the southern and eastern parts of Afghanistan. Coming in third are the Hazaras, who make up about 9% of the population. Hazaras are primarily found in the central highlands of Afghanistan and are mostly Shiite Muslims. Then there are the Uzbeks, a Turkic-speaking group that accounts for about 9% of the population. Predominantly Sunni Muslim, Uzbeks are found in the northern parts of Afghanistan. Finally, there are the Turkmen, making up roughly 3% of the population. Turkmen are also found mostly in the northern areas and are also generally Sunni Muslim. There are many more ethnic groups in Afghanistan, but in much smaller percentages. Besides, after centuries of intermarriage between these groups, it's not always easy to classify Afghans as part of one ethnic group or another. Nonetheless, the Pashtuns have generally dominated Afghan politics throughout much of its history. Before 1978, nearly 80% of Afghanistan's population lived in rural areas. These were mostly small villages scattered throughout the country. Life in these areas was very difficult and fragile. Life could turn on a dime due to a change in weather patterns or a crop failure. Infant mortality rates were very high and the average life expectancy was just over 40 years. Because life was so fragile, rural Afghans could be very protective of their few possessions. Disputes and even death could result from one person encroaching on someone else's farmland. Another important trait of these rural Afghans was their devotion to Islam. It cannot be overestimated how important Islam is to the everyday lives of most Afghans, especially those in the rural areas. Disputes that might turn violent could be minimized or even reconciled by asking one party to back down for the pleasure of Allah. So it should come as no surprise, these rural Afghans were ready to go to war when the PDPA tried to redistribute their land and promote un-Islamic policies. These villages would provide the bulk of the Mujahideen warriors during the Soviet-Afghan war. The rural population began to change after the Soviets arrived. The invasion disrupted the already fragile ecosystem, forcing millions of Afghans to either flee the country or move to the larger cities. This disruption to rural life was further exacerbated by the civil war of the early 1990s and the U.S. invasion in 2001. It's important to remember that the war did not begin when the Soviets invaded in 1979. It really began when the PDPA took over the government and began pushing communist policies. In these early stages, when it was just an uprising against the communist government, the Afghan Mujahideen were just small militias centered around local villages. The fighters in these militias were mostly older men, farmers, and shepherds from the same village. They banded together, took up arms, and attacked local district capitals and military installations. When the Soviets did invade, 
these fighters started attacking them as well. After all, the Soviets were responsible for the communist governments pushing these unpopular policies and tormenting their people. This first generation of Mujahideen fought against the Soviets using inferior and outdated weapons. Some of them were still using infield bolt action rifles which had been obsolete even before World War II. So how did they manage? How were a bunch of unpaid volunteers able to fight not only against their government, but also a global superpower? There were three factors that helped the Mujahideen in these early stages of the war. I call them the three Ps. Plunder, Pakistan, and patience. When we talk about plunder, we're talking about the spoils of war. The primary source of weapons and money for the early Mujahideen was, ironically, the Soviet military. The plunder taken from successful operations was a critical part of the Mujahideen strategy. The Mujahideen could sell captured Soviet weapons and equipment at the markets in Peshawar, Pakistan. Or, if they wanted to, they could keep these items for themselves. Speaking of Pakistan, that brings us to the second P. Hollywood movies such as Rambo 3 and Charlie Wilson's War make it seem as if the United States was solely responsible for the Mujahideen's victory. But Pakistan had been supporting the Afghan Mujahideen long before the United States got involved. In my opinion, the Soviets would not have been defeated were it not for Pakistan. We'll go into more depth about Pakistan's and America's involvement later in this series, inshallah. The final P is patience. The Mujahideen were a guerrilla force. They mostly relied on ambushes and surprise attacks. Their objective was to hit the enemy hard, then quickly disappear into the mountains. They knew they could not fight a full frontal war against the Soviets. Instead, they were fighting a war of attrition. They were hoping to wear down the enemy enough to convince him to withdraw. This strategy, of course, required a lot of patience from the Mujahideen. And as it turns out, the Afghans are known for their patience. There is a famous saying attributed to a Taliban commander in the early 2000s as the United States and its allies began massing weapons and soldiers in Afghanistan. You have the watches, but we have the time. In the next episode, inshallah, we will discuss the politics and players behind the Afghan Jihad. See the description below for a list of some of the resources I use for this series. Click the box to the right to save this playlist to your library and click the box to your left to learn more about the early rulers of Afghanistan.